Hey guys, Freaky Finance here. Today we're going to tackle Airbnb, and the whole idea behind this video is mainly about scale, what scale means. So I go, I, I've been going through probably five companies a week now for, I want to say, four years. <laughs> uh, some of them are the same company, so it's easier for me to do. Some of them are new. Airbnb, I looked at when it first came public, and I didn't buy it, and I've recently started looking at it again. I'll disclose right off the start that I do own this one, and I'm slowly, the game plan here, slowly add as the market continues to go down assuming it does it so anyway we'll, we'll jump into it so airbnb i'm assuming you're familiar with the product basically it allows people with hard assets to uh unlock value from the assets they already own or they've bought and levered against and the idea i guess the core idea is experiences right so airbnbs can pop up anywhere um the business model is great because it's really an app a marketing tool for people to try to get their assets out there and unlock value from them so like they have a oh my god that they've been advertising lately which is just a little tab where you can get try to get more unique stays again the idea is experiences more than it is a traditional like hotel stay and you can see that they're trying to cater to that type of traveler who wants to experience new things in different places things that not everyone else has already done right <laughs> probably the most important page if i had to sum up airbnb is this page it's the, the fee page because this feeds into the business model very well. So they have a unique offering, obviously a first mover advantage for both trying to copy this on the Expedia side, which I own. I own more Expedia than I do Airbnb at this point. But as Airbnb continues to collapse, uh, underlying fundamentals continue to improve, I start getting excited, right? So hence the video. Host fee, so basically Airbnb charges the host a fee. So it takes into the host's cut from their take home. Then they also charge a guest fee on top of whatever the host was charging. To the end user so we would see the the total fee at the end is the amount that we would pay that would include the 14 percent then the host whatever they take uh they lose three percent it's kind of nice to know over here if you know anything about economics whatever the host fee is going to be they'll probably just push that to the guest fee anyway like they'll push it on the guest <laughs> so it's a matter of a naming convention here but i just thought it'd be interesting and you should be surprised at how high this is so that's quite the take rate for an app <laughs> that has embedded scale and leverage but it does tell you the power that Airbnb enables, right? It does drive quite a bit of business. In fact, there's people that make their whole earnings off of leveraging hard assets on uh, Airbnb. That's probably the critical page. This is an example. So here you have a $100 charge for a three-night stay, um, plus 60 bucks that the host would charge for a cleaning fee to cover their cleaning costs, basically. So basically, they say 3% of that 360 is the amount deducted from the host. So the host... They sell this thing for three nights, 360 bucks. They take as four or three forty nine twenty, And then what the host, the guest would see. So what I would see if I was trying to book this asset is that I would pay this amount. So of that $300 or $360 charge, Airbnb walks away with 1080 and 5040. Not a bad take rate. <laughs> right? it's, and you'll see this when we go to the numbers in a second. The main, I'm going to focus on the numbers today because I think most people understand the product proposition and the uniqueness in the space and how it is kind of a first mover advantage, especially in the younger demographics. And it's continuing to go up the age ladder as people realize how easy it is. And I think COVID helped that as well. One of the things before I jump to numbers is one of the reasons I think it's scaling as it has is COVID forced these guys to restructure right away. The business got slammed initially during the COVID when everything shut down. A worldwide restructuring plan in May 2020, they reduced their headcount by 25%, which is pretty amazing, right? And total restructuring charges as of the latest quarter was $265 million, so that's how much they've uh, take, basically taken out of expenses and moved to restructuring charges over the last almost two years, which isn't small for these guys. The costs are actually, well, they've been coming down. Part of that is noise from share-based comp. These guys pay themselves well. We'll go through the negatives and, at the end, but right now I want to focus on some of the positives. But anyway, I want to bring that up because it, it does show, if you look on a, one of the reasons why we're seeing scale isn't just that the underlying business is growing, which it is, and growing quite well at high margins, it's because they're also cut costs during COVID. So let's jump to the numbers because they speak really for themselves. <laughs> it's very rarely that I have all green, only two reds, and that's mainly from share-based comp. But anyway, we'll get, so gross booking value, you can see we're up 67% year over year. Um, part of that's highly da daily rates, which I don't think is going to grow like it has. So that should uh, slow down. Which I think the market trying to front run. 
on the call well, over the past year, they've mentioned that domestic and short distance travel recovered first and they're starting to see it more in their international now. And they're starting to see trends back into city. Whereas uh, during COVID, it was more uh, suburban. It's like a hydra, so many heads all over the place, all over the world. Um, but one of the things I want to point out is here. <laughs> uh, really, yeah, these three lines, revenue, COGS, and GMD. So you have GMD, or revenue up 70%, but then you have gross margin dollars almost doubling. <laughs> and just for context, um, you increase your revenues by $622 million, but you only had to incur $108 million more in COGS. And of that 108 million more in COGS, only 92 million is due to merchant fees. <laughs> and I have it all caps there, but that, that's pretty impressive, right? Imagine earning six more dollars year over year, but only having to pay one dollar to generate it, right? That, it's, it's pretty impressive. And it's starting to get into bigger numbers now, right? We're not talking, they were doing under a billion dollars a quarter in revenue now. Now they're doing 1.5 billion a quarter in revenue, right? So this is gonna start generating some material cash flow it technically already has started and started to do um, post positive EBITDA uh, consecutively now so it's good good time so you have positive EBITDA so it's affecting positive so we're not going to get any more shareholder dilution or we shouldn't <laughs> and uh, more importantly it doesn't need to go and access liquidity on the capital markets unlike other tech companies that aren't uh, cash flow positive this company has a lot of cash and it's starting to generate cash on its own operations Though we'll talk about cash in a second because there's a weird thing going on in the cash flow statement. Again, just for scale, imagine getting 600 million more in revenue, but only having to incur 50 million more <laughs> in operations and support on the back office. And here they flagged they had 31 million increase due to uh, support personnel and 8 million more from insurance. So it's nice that they're so detailed because you'd expect a company that generates such high amounts of revenue. I'm surprised they're still disclosing things that are under $10 million in cost. But Anyway, here you can see product and development. So this is a little bit misleading. Um, Share-based comp is a big factor for Airbnb. The executives are paying themselves quite well, and they did that in 2020 and 2021. So part of the reason why the year over year scale is so good is share-based comp kind of normalized. So now, so the, the rate of change in the scale is kind of skewed. So anyway, you can see here it stayed flat with 70% more revenue. That could mean they're underinvesting in the future, but I don't think that's the case. I think this was just high because of a uh, share-based comp. And it was very high in 2020. <laughs> Here you can go sales and marketing. So this is the one that's actually going up with revenue. So the more they're generating revenue, the more they're spending on marketing. Here they flagged, um, they spent 112 million more on made possible by host marketing campaign. So technically it only went up 50%. So it still scaled off the 70% revenue, but it's one of the weaker ones. So if you're trying to get scale, you're looking at operation support, product development, and GNA. GNA is pretty crazy, right? You only you barely you're only up ten percent with seventy percent more revenue, um, and of this little increase of twenty one million bucks, they mentioned ten million is for donation expense to Ukraine, and eight million was more from business and operational taxes. Um, restructuring charges fees have gone down, so uh, I, I kind of touched on that briefly. They reduced the workforce in twenty twenty, and that's been a continuing theme during twenty twenty one. And now it's pretty much normalized, so they don't have any of these extra costs. Um, restructuring costs basically just you incur these expensive and you're trying to move it below the line to show that these aren't reoccurring. <laughs> That's what this is. So um, basically, it just helps reinforce that they have pulled a decent amount of cost out of the business while the business continues to grow materially, which is what I like. Interest expense is a little bit weird here, so they had an early for payment fee. So there's noise in this nine. You can see this 377.2 million. Um, basically they had debt and they bought, paid it off early, which incurred a fee. And then they reissued convertible senior notes. You can see the company almost positive finally. So we should see that. But the main disconnect here is you can see CFO is actually $1.2 billion in a quarter. So I have a company that used to be burning a billion bucks in, in net income. Um, it's still generating a decent amount. The main disconnect between CFO and free cash flow to net income is one share based comp they add that back here and two um they add back the delta in honored fees which we'll talk about on the balance sheet but uh anyway here you can see the share price getting pretty much destroyed even though the business is about to inflect positive both in terms well it's already inflected positive in ebitda and cash flow and it's about to inflect positive in net income or at least that's what i believe <laughs> um share price so you can see it get halved with the market 
So the company is $52 billion cheaper as the company is technically putting up the best numbers it ever has. So I like that because I knew when it, when it IPO, the company was too expensive and I didn't want to touch it. But now I'm starting to starting to buy into it because this is special. <laughs> this whole, well, really the metrics here are special. I hate just the scale on every line. But anyway, um, balance sheet, important. They have almost $7 billion in cash. Um, well, technically more if you add back to the marketable securities. One of the things that's funny is their, <laughs> their PPE. So they, like their hard assets on the balance sheet are only $156 million. So imagine generating, let's just run rate this to $6 billion a year in revenue, but only having $150 million in hard assets to earn it. That's special, right? That's uh, pretty unique. <laughs> so, and that shows up here on the CapEx line. So they barely have to drive any CFO back into the business in CapEx terms. They'll drive it into product and development terms for future offerings and stuff. And they'll drive it into marketing to keep growing the business, to get more and more scale off this crazy 75% margin. But it's just, it's, it's a special business is what I'm trying to say. Is that it barely requires any additional CapEx spend to keep growing at very high rates. I mean, it won't be 70%, but even like, Imagine it's growing 20% and only having to put 5 million in on $1.5 billion numbers, right? <laughs> it's, it's, it's special. Anyway, so the balance sheet in terms of assets is fine. They have qu quite a bit of cash, quite a bit in uh, marketable securities, um, low amount of goodwill, which is special. So again, this company has actually been pretty well able to grow organically since the great financial crisis, really. They just recently went public, but this company has actually been around for quite some time. Um, they do have some debt. Obviously, you can see the cash. It easily covers the total debt. Um, Unearned fees is the interesting thing. So that's the liability on the balance sheet. Um, but it tells you the rate of change in growth. <laughs> this, this is how quickly it's growing. It used to have only 903 million unearned fees. Now it has 1.7 billion in unearned fees. So this company is growing like crazy. And this is an easy proxy to see it on the balance sheet at any given point of time during that. Like at the end of each quarter, you can see how this is growing. And that will tell you likely the future or the current growth rate and what you could expect in the future, at least on a quarterly comp basis. Um, not necessarily true, but that's kind of how I view it. Um, balance sheet's fine. They do have quite a bit in accumulated deficit over the last, so they haven't been profitable up until basically, well, even this last quarter, they weren't technically profitable. But I think we're finally about to inflect positive. I should mention the $6 billion is big. But a part of that is because they had huge losses in 2020 because they IPO'd and basically paid themselves $3 billion in share based comp when the company only generated $3 billion in revenue. <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, um, almost half, probably more than half the deficit is from the, the founders and the executive team paying themselves while well, the company was still in growth mode and still is in growth mode. Now it's finally just getting into profitability mode. I do think the free cash flow is slightly misleading. Um, because they add back the honor and fees. So this delta of $800 million, they add back, back into um, CFO. And it's not wrong per se, because it technically is cash from operations, but it's cash from operations, from services you're going to do in the future. <laughs> so it, it takes the current CFO, which is fine, like the current actual operating earnings, which is fine. It would have been something like $400 million. But it kind of overstates the current um, cash flow from generated from current earnings, if that makes sense, because they're kind of pulling forward the cash they receive currently that they're going to earn in future periods, but they've already recorded in free cash flow this quarter. Uh, margins are amazing. <laughs> I already talked about the scale. It's pretty amazing. EBITDA is finally positive. Adjusted EBITDA, I should say, is finally positive. Um, they do have bad add back share-based comp. Um, they do pay themselves quite well. In the latest quarter, investors lost $19 million. But share base comp was 240 million. But yeah, overall, you can see scale across every line item with a very high growth rate with the company getting cut in half. So I like all these things. That's the video. And in my mind, the only thing wrong with Airbnb is the valuation and the fact that insiders keep dumping because this business right here is special. <laughs> it's, uh, I don't see it very often. And it's finally coming back down to a price that 
at least it could get into at some point. Like if I were to annualize this number, which I don't agree with, it's a little bit early, but say if it's, say if I do annualize it, right, 4.8 billion a year. So at least we're only getting, we're getting close to 10 times free cash flow for this year, right? Which is pretty special for a company growing 70%. <laughs> so, and that, I know in the long run, I think this investment's going to be fine. I just don't know how, how much cheaper I can get it in the interim, right? During this every, sell everything panic, but it's starting to look pretty good. <laughs> I like things that are growing 70% year over year and getting halved in uh, equity market cap, but it could get halved again, which would be uh, very special. That's when I'd actually get bigger into this one. I've kind of talked about, well, I haven't really talked about average daily rate. Right? So they've been actually one of the reasons for the growth is because inflation. So their hosts are pushing through their costs to the end users as well. And because Airbnb's model is a percent based on the amount that the host charges, they're scaling with inflation. So they're basically just ride inflation for free. So that's nice in this type of environment. It's also one of the reasons why the growth rate is probably overstated in terms of revenue. I did think the trip length comments very interesting. So long-term stays of 28 days or more remain our fastest growing category which tells me people might be using Airbnbs almost to live in or quasi live in. Do I live here? They'll just rent Airbnb for a month and then, oh, I mean, I don't, probably don't want to live here. I'll go somewhere else, right? Maybe at work from anywhere in the world is unlocking some more longer trips, but I thought the trend was interesting. I wasn't expecting it. I've already mentioned that domestic and short-term travel continue to be more popular in, in 2019. Um, they are starting to see improvement in longer distance across border travel, which is reflective of other things we've read so far this quarter. All right, cash from operations. Kind of harped on it already. But here I wanted to point out, this is the annual numbers. So here I wanted to point out the $3 billion in stock-based comp. Okay, it sticks out like a eyesore in 2020. One of the reasons why the company looks as unprofitable it does on that accumulated deficit line is because management paid themselves very well when this thing IPO'd. Well, they booked the expense to pay themselves very well during the IPO. One of the reasons why the company is showing as good scale as it is is share-based comp is finally coming back down to a more normal level. Here's the honored fees going up on the balance sheet. So that's kind of what's flagging in my uh, CFO, like the increase in free cash flow. A part of that is them booking this delta, which is fine. It's just really they're increasing CFO a little bit early. <laughs> so it's, we're getting the cash flow from current operations, but we're also picking up the delta in honored fees from what they're going to earn in future quarters, right? <laughs> so, but it's picking it up currently in the free cash flow. Now, it, it technically won't matter. Um, it's just the CFO is a little preemptive, or the free cash flow in Q1 reported is a little preemptive, but it won't be as soon as they earn it. And as long as the delta keeps increasing, the business keeps growing, you're never going to really notice it. <laughs> um what else what else did i go through i think i've talked about everything important talked about the adrs a bit basically average daily rate still up quite a bit from 2019 levels um but the growth rate is slowing so that means the revenue growth rate should slow so again i don't know what the share price is going to keep reacting to as the g continues to decline i'm hoping i'm hoping like it would be very nice if i get this company for I don't know, say it's like worth $40 billion and it has a run rate already and getting probably close to $5 billion in free cash flow, right? Get something for $40 billion, that's eight times free cash flow in a company that's growing like this with margins like it has with scale that's embedded in the financials. It'd be very attractive. That'd be the dream for this company. Anyway, <laughs> I'm kind of rambling. Um, I did flag the insider selling, well, especially one specifically just keeps selling. He's one of the founders. Ever since the IPO, all he's done is sell shares. Actually, ever since the IPO, all they've done is drum shares. There's no buying. Unlike Uber, which has started buying their own shares, uh, mainly Dara, who used to be the CEO of Expedia. He's uh, starting to buy shares in Uber, which is another company that's finally inflecting positive in terms of EBITDA and should shortly follow with free cash flow, which has also been getting killed. In another, I'll do another video probably on Uber too, but uh, Airbnb's scale is even more apparent than Uber's. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, here's the share price. You can see it's pretty short tenure since it IPO'd. It IPO'd, I looked at it, it was like it's pretty expensive. And now it's finally back down to at least something I could pay for, which I started paying for at 97. And I'm hoping if this trend continues, it'd be nice, right? <laughs> but even if it flatlines and the business keeps improving, that'd be good too, I'd slowly add. But ideally, if I can get it under 10 times um, uh, future 12 month free cash flow 
I uh, will feel pretty happy here. <laughs> um, and then again, just to show the trend, is the, is the business actually improving over time, right? So this is quarterly 2019, 2020, 2021. The main line I'd look at here, hopefully you guys can see it's a little bit of information. The main line I'd look at here is the adjusted EBITDA line. So you can see that they, even in 2019, some quarters they're still burning 250 million, right? They're almost still down about 300 million in 2019. You can see 2020 wasn't very kind to them. And then you can see the last three quarters and including we just went through uh, Q1 2022 numbers. And you can see the last few quarters have been very good on terms of pro consistent profitability finally for Airbnb. And more importantly to me is the free cash flow, especially in this type of market. And the trailing 12 months free cash flow continues just to go from a big burn in 2020 to a big positive in 2021. Then that continued in 2022 so far in Q1 anyway. But again, part of that's that delta in unearned <laughs> fees. But uh, you can see it's getting pretty special, right? Still technically expensive, right? It still says, I think it's a $60 billion company. 61 billion does have just call it 9 billion in cash 2 billion in debt so net 7 so you subtract that you're at 54 billion dollars 54 billion dollars with a run rate backwards looking is only 2 something or 2.5 but if I were to analyze this recent number you're getting 4.4 so it's starting to get cheap right 5 let's call it 5.54 billion divided by 4 billion right 54 divided by 4 13.5 times free cash flow. Be nice if I get it 30% cheap from here. We'll have to see. We'll have to see what the market gives up. <laughs> so far, it's been prudent to wait, but it's starting to get exciting. And I've never seen a company scale like this. It's uh, pretty unique. Anyway, hope you guys like the video. It's a little bit different. It's a growth year company. It technically is still expensive. But yeah, have a have a great rest of your weekend.